who's wrong and who's wronger. In this corner, followed by Millions James, the exploding unicorn, Breakwell. And in that corner, ignored by millions, Steve Dosh, Rinko Levers. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Boudoir Pose edition of Wrong and Wronger. I am Steve, always get up on time, Olivas. He is James. Ever since I prepaid for a couple of months of this stupid show, I feel like I can do whatever I want, break well. And uh, James... This is not only All Hallows' Eve upon which we are recording, this is my last day in this empty office and there's no furniture upon which for me to sit. I am lying prostrate on the floor. Well, that is where you belong, obviously, and we have much to discuss here, including what happened to one particular item from that office, but first I would just like to note that I am only late today because I, unlike you, take the holidays seriously and took an extra 10 minutes this morning to get into costume. So, so what are you uh -oh. dressed as, despite, you know, other than just a, a sad person who owns nothing? Well, based on the shirt I'm wearing, I look like an Italian tablecloth. Does that count? <laughs> yeah, I will I will go with I would also accept ghost, but uh, e either one. Uh, I, however, am dressed as Gru from the Minions, and to put on this costume, Ooh. I had to put on a black shirt and then put on a scarf. Obviously, that is a complex <laughs> process that added 10 minutes to my morning routine, so thank you for your patience <laughs> so I could pull off this cinematic wonder for our viewers. Well, I had much more depressing light that was all set up, but the fluorescent light that had flickered like out of existence flickered back to life during the interim. So instead of a sad and depressing uh, atmosphere, uh, I have a bright and festive atmosphere. And so uh, I suppose I'm in the party spirit right along with you, Breakwell. So what you're saying is my delay literally brought the light back into your life. God, I wish I didn't have to say it that way, but <laughs> I suppose one could look at it that way, yes. Well, I, I'm glad. I also note that you have not been murdered or taken away to a CIA black site, so no. uh, maybe explain to the viewers why that might have been a risk. Oh, I sent you that picture. You did? Oh, I don't have it with me. It, I took it home. Mrs. Steve, <laughs> let me first say... Mrs. Steve, without telling me, snuck into this office and cleaned everything, uh, allegedly, so I would get my security deposit back, but probably more because she admires and worships me. But uh, I am because of her lying on a clean floor because this was an absolute disaster. It looked like I hastily packed and I was on the lam from Interpol <laughs> when uh, I left here. There was paper shreds and I had to... I won't even mention what I had to do to one desk to get it out the door, but there was like wood chips and sawdust everywhere. But anyway, Mrs. Steve, while she was going through everything, noticed a particular box that had never been opened. Not being a fan of the show, she of course does not listen and uh, had no idea what the significance of the box was. And uh, she had noted the box was in this office for quite some time and had still not been, like the tape was still intact. So she opened the box, James! She opened the box! And it was such a sad moment. And she was going to retape it because I was thinking one of the options was to send it to you. And that was on the table in my mind. But I thought it would just sully the moment, so I sent you the picture of the open box. Well, you should have sent it to me because it was an awesome laptop, as I expected. Although it is three years out of delay or out of date due to your due to your cowardice, but your wife is not a coward. She is a woman of action. She saw a box and she did what all normal people will do when they receive a box. She opened it and she was rewarded with a laptop. I believe on the day your other laptop died. It it really was. <clears throat> Yeah, she sent me proudly that picture, and uh, I, would, I had just complained because I was in the airport that day, and I said, I can't get my laptop to boot up. This thing is like eight years old, and it's been all over the North America, all over the U.S. and Canada. I've thrown it in and out of airplanes, and it finally died. And she said, well, good news, and she sent the picture. And I had such mixed emotions, James. I didn't know what to do with all the feelings that were flooding into me. 
So I guess we need to we need to break down what happened when she when she opened the box. Did a series of alarms go off? Uh, well, in fairness, I wasn't here. I was at the airport. But she she did not note alarms or smoke bombs, no flashbangs, <clears throat> no uh, no black clad <laughs> officials coming down, ropes from helicopters crashing through the windows. None of that. I assume she was just protecting me from the reality of what happened after she opened the box because it was too horrific to put into words. So this is twice now where I have made fortuitous predictions for your life. I, I delayed you by 10 minutes, thus giving you back light. And this entire time I said there was a laptop in there that you could use. And the day that someone finally took my advice, your other laptop died. Weird how that works. I couldn't, I couldn't believe after all the material, all the mileage we got out of that box, she came strolling in off the street and just popped the thing open like it had no significance in the world. And there was a nice Lenovo laptop, laptop in there. Maybe you should have her dig up that mystery grave you're afraid of on the ranch. Maybe, maybe we just let her do all of our exciting things and you just report from a safe distance. <laughs> now, I will say I have not fired up the laptop which might be when the electronic beacon is activated. Ooh. So there is still a chance that international authorities could be called in and I could be dragged out of my home in handcuffs and underpants. So what you're telling me is it will not be turned on until your wife gets sick of seeing it sit there and hits the power <laughs> button. There, I don't, listen, I can't speak for her. I certainly don't know what motivates her sometimes. After all, she is the person who chose to marry me. But without questioning her judgment any further, I will say she does not fear me getting dragged off in handcuffs and underpants. I'll just leave that right there. I mean, that, that, that is fair. None of us fear that. In fact, I look forward to it very much. <laughs> uh, man, so you have, so since your, that was days ago, so since your lap, other laptop died and you haven't powered up the new one, you have just been laptopless for this entire time. Well, s sort of. I don't have a personal one anymore. I do have my work laptop. So my new office gave us all, I think they're Dell laptops. I have a little one that uh, the office gave me. So I am able to follow along with what's happening on the interweb. But you have not done any actual work in the intervening 19 days. I've been out of town for most of them. Did you need that other laptop for like a PowerPoint presentation or anything? The, my personal one? Yeah, the one that you were taking to the airport and it died. Presumably you were taking it because you needed it for something. It's been a strange gray area that I've been living in, James, because I'm supposed to be working on a book with several celebrities that have no interest in working on the book that I have spent all my time writing and all they have to do is edit. So I did have those books on that laptop, but they're saved in several places so I can get to them. I always bring that laptop with me because I'm never quite sure when I'm going to need access to something on it. Now, the one thing that was lost that I think I can recreate although I, I'll need to look into it today, is the, uh, the royalty statements for all my authors, because today I have to send out royalty checks, and I have to do some research into when the last time I saved that to the cloud was. I'm hoping I still have it intact and I'm able to pay them properly. But otherwise, that had like back episodes, all of the back library of Wrong and Wronger and 10 Minutes were on that laptop. And those aren't saved, but they're all on the platform, SoundCloud or whatever people listen to it on. And I know you have copies of everything because you don't throw anything away. So I, if ever we need to go back and do something like repost that peeing in the shower episode, I know you'll be all over it, James. Well, but otherwise, uh, that was just a backup for a bunch of stuff. Nowadays, all of our pictures are in the cloud like all of our personal stuff. So I don't think I needed, needed it for anything in particular. I haven't come across anything yet anyway. You are incorrect. I no longer have the uh, files for the old episodes because I had to nuke my computer. It wouldn't turn on one day. And that was the, that was the only remedy. I had to reinstall Windows and delete everything on there. Uh, but it was a blessing because I had files on there from five years ago that I was never under any circumstances going to access again. And uh, Bill Gates absolved me of that guilt. He said, you know what, we're just going to erase everything and give you a fresh start. So, uh, so thanks, Bill. I, I do appreciate that. My soul is lighter now that it is no longer burdened by all of that stuff that really no human being has ever seen. 
Man, you are the anti-hoarder, aren't you? Like if something ain't bolted down and you'll, uh, you haven't looked at it in four and a half hours, it's gone out of your life, isn't it? I have been on a decluttering spree lately. I am so proud of myself. Um, I've been buying all these board games. We discussed before how I didn't have enough time in my life to play them. And I put 58 up for sale and I sold them. So I bought six new games and sold 58. And I feel wow. like that's the right exchange rate. I would like now that every time I bring something new into my life to get rid of multiple old things, be they games, children, what have you. Stuff's going out the door these days. My life is getting simpler. Why? So I'm the opposite. I hang on to things and I feel nostalgic and it makes Mrs. Steve crazy because uh, if I fall asleep for too long, she's actually wheeling me out to the dumpster, which uh, it's a good thing I've woken up every time and ran back to the house. But I don't understand why you keep wanting to cling to this show like uh, rats on a sinking ship when you're the one that jettisons everything that's useless out of your life. Because this serves a very useful purpose for me. First of all, it keeps our one listener entertained. And second of all, <laughs> second of all, it keeps me entertained because every week I get to hear about you. And no matter how bad my life is, no matter how ridiculous my circumstances, I could just go talk to you and say, wow, things really aren't so bad by comparison. Uh, that's actually a term in psychology. That's one of the cognitive strategies to overcome like a minor league depression called downward comparison. And that uh, you compare your life to people that have it worse and you end up feeling better because of it. It's about perspective. Wow, that, uh, that seems really sketchy for psychology, but good for them. It's basically like a catty internet person. You just go out and you're a, a misfortune voyeur. And uh, yeah, I, guess, I guess that's what I am. I guess it is endorsed by the psychological community. So uh, go me. Well, let's talk about your costume because you still have children, I assume, that go trick-or-treating like door-to-door, -door, right? I do. Uh, the, it's debatable how much longer my older one is going to do it. If it weren't for the judgment uh -huh. of her friends, she would probably do it forever. She is small enough to get away with it. Uh, my wife keeps uh -huh. saying maybe this is her last year. We'll see. I think she fears the judgment of her friends, but once she collects 50 pounds of candy, that fear of judgment will go away. So we'll, we'll see how tonight goes. Now, uh, I'm, a, I'm guessing that you are very chilly tonight because you're directly north of us and we're gonna be pretty chilly tonight. Will that put a damper on the trick-or-treat festivities? It will, well, well, we'll see. It's gonna be dry, which is the most important thing. If it's wet, there's really nothing you can do about it. But their, their Minions costumes are like pajama onesies that go over everything else they're wearing. So I suspect mm. that will keep them warm. Also, they'll be jumping in and out of the car. Also, they'll have the thrill of the hunt to warm them up. So there's just gonna be a lot of factors working in their favor. So we'll, we'll see. I suspect we will make it the full runtime of Halloween tonight. There was a very cold Halloween or trick or treat probably five or six years ago. It was right after Frozen came out, ironically, <laughs> because there were probably a hundred Elsas that were buried under layers of winter jackets freezing in our front yard that year. Did you? I think the Spider Man movie had just come out too, because the girls were all dressed as Elsa and there were a whole lot of boys dressed as Spider Man that year. I'm hearing that everyone expected uh, the popular costume to be Ken and Barbie, and yeah. no one is Ken and Barbie because everyone thought everyone else was doing it. And there are now <laughs> no Ken and Barbies, which is a real tragedy for that marketing department. Well, so your Gru, yes. uh, your girls are minions. What is Lola going as? Uh, the lady spy. And she probably is not going as anything. She wore it for the, the Halloween functions over the weekend. And that's probably the end of it. There's a there's a spy that wears a teal dress and has red hair up in a bun or something. Mm -hmm. And that I don't know the names. I I don't know. There's there there is a female character somewhere in the movies, yeah. and that is her. You've seen the movies. Give me a break. I don't remember you the names of people in real life. I'm not going to remember her. She was like in the second or third one. Like I bear, I watched bits and pieces of the first. I saw bits and pieces of the second. Like I don't I don't watch whole movies, Steve. That's not how life works. I see movies walking in and out of the room. I'm I'm a dad. That I can't sit still for that long. <laughs> well, in the movie, that character loved Gru, and uh, I don't know how it works in your household, but maybe that's why Lola's not going as that character when you actually 
enter public well, domain. That is true. She was, I, I'm not a very good Gru. I got, this costume came with a bald cap and a ridiculous nose that really looked nothing like Gru, but I was going to wear them because I paid for them, and, and she vetoed that. So now I am <laughs> Gru with a full, beautiful head of hair. I'm probably the best looking Gru that has ever walked the face of the earth, and I'm oh not going to apologize for that. I just, I am who I am. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Now, you do something that I judge, which is Ooh. use a car to trick or treat door to door. Do you do that to drive your kids to the neighborhood or do you actually like cart them from door to door? I, I did it the old fashioned way until I realized that was stupid. Like we were only hurting ourselves. We were, <laughs> we were diminishing our range. We could only go, you know, three, four miles overnight. Uh, and you, there's, there's, you get to times where it's like, okay, the next house is a quarter mile away. Like, what do you gain by walking that quarter mile? So I now drop my kids off in clusters of houses and give them instructions. Like, all right, these four houses then load back up and we're going. And they jump in. I barely clo the, close the van door and we just keep going. It is, it is miraculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we only have the second most efficient approach. There are people who use golf carts, which are even better because there's no doors. You're lower to the ground. You can squeeze oh, in between other geez. people who are driving their kids like that those are the people who really clean up now you live in suburbia there's got to be like subdivisions where the houses are pretty tightly clumped together aren't there? there are but i you got to remember not everybody has the halloween spirit so there are clusters oh. i mean all the houses are close together i mean even where i am on the grid streets but you know like my street here there's a hundred houses and there's like five people yep. who remember that it's halloween so you just wow. it's spread out people man they have hate in their heart they turn off their lights and they hide in their bedrooms watching tv on halloween night and it is sad they should be out there giving yeah, me they're... candy. Not my kids, me. <laughs> that was one of my greatest joys was uh, standing out front with the candy and just doing like improv bits with the kids and messing with them and the parents. Like, I love that stuff. I can't imagine someone that just wants to keep the porch light off and uh, turn on, I, I don't know, the Hallmark Channel or something and hunker down while everyone's knocking at their door. I don't get people, James. Yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do when uh, when my kids are too old to trick-or-treat, other than going you know, trick-or-treating with my grandkids. Because I, I like the idea of seeing kids' costumes, but I hate the idea of mm -hmm. it being interrupted. Like, I don't want a two-hour spree where I'm going to sit down and be like, all right, I'm going to try to watch this show, but every two minutes somebody rings the doorbell. Like, that would just drive me insane. <laughs> so I think I will probably always be the person person who puts out a bowl of candy that's what we're going to do as we go to the community and take candy there will also be a bowl on our porch mm -hmm. to give it away however nobody really comes through our neighborhood to trick-or-treat so we'll try to give away like 10 pounds of candy and we'll probably still have nine pounds of it left at the end of the night plus the 50 pounds we hopefully bring in ourselves so it'll be a good haul you know we <clears> did that <throat> once and uh, decided never again to put out the 20 pound bowl of candy because uh I don't remember, we weren't out very long and we had to run back to the house for something. And it must have been, I'm guessing it had to have been teenagers that came through and just emptied the bowl into their pillowcase. And so we were afraid that our house was then in danger of being vandalized by angry children because there was no candy left. But after that, Mrs. Steve was in charge of trick or treat and I stood on the porch and uh, messed with the kids that came up. But I would never be in the house waiting for the doorbell to ring. I'm up front and center, like uh, inviting all the children to the yard. That that, that sounded weird. That is better. So I've, I've seen people who have like a fire pit out front hanging out with their yep. friends, having a few that drinks. That, that's a good yes. way to do it. But sitting inside getting interrupted, man, I, I couldn't do it. I just, I just couldn't do it. Because, uh, you know, as soon as you get to a good part in the show, as soon as you get to a good part in the conversation, there's going to be, you know, 15 kids on your porch. And then when you're bored, there's going to be nobody. You will be sad and alone. So it'll always be the worst of all worlds. <laughs> when my son got too old to trick or treat, he and I uh, set up our fire pit on the street. And we were roasting hot dogs. So we were giving candy to the kids and hot dogs to the parents. That's a, that's a good way to do it. I can, I can definitely respect that. We, do, we don't have a, a driveway. We have a parking slab, and it's out back where there would never be any trick-or-treaters. Like, trick-or-treaters really shouldn't be wandering down alleys. But we can set it up on the sidewalk. The problem with setting up a fire pit and, like, uh, you know, a circle of chairs on the sidewalk is nobody could walk past you. Like, we would block all foot traffic. So I'm not, I'm not sure if there's a good way to balance that out. Huh. I guess you're going to have to move. Well, clearly, 
because you, you just pick it. Well, you know what? We, our town has a street like that that is like the holiday street. They're very proud really? of their 4th of July party. Like realtors should be like, oh, this house is on the parade route. And it's big. so it's like it's like Main Street, but not Main Street. It's like a random side street of big old oh. houses where everybody gets into the spirit of things. So they do the parade and then they do Halloween. And it's actually the worst place in the world to trick or treat because they're so known for trick or treating that everybody from across town goes to that one street and you get yep. five thousand kids and all the houses know they're going to get 5,000 kids so every house only gives out one piece of candy and that that's terrible you want to hop Ooh. in your minivan and go out to the boonies to the far flung little bit risky corners <laughs> of the suburb where they only get like two kids a night and then they just dump the whole candy bag in there you're not even stealing they're giving it away because they don't want to eat it all themselves well that's when the uh, that's high tide like our trick or treat, I think is from six to eight. And so when you get around 745 and people get desperate to dump that candy, that's when you can really clean up. It is. People who quit early have it all wrong. If anything, go out late. Just yeah. make sure you get yeah. that magical last 15 minute window. And granted, sometimes you get there a moment too late that you get there and they dump their whole bowl for the kid before you. But sometimes you time it just right and you get more <laughs> than you would have gotten in another hour of trick or treating just by going to one door. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I miss those days. Uh, I know this is going to be hard to believe, but we didn't get any trick-or-treaters last year. Well, you do have a giant no trespassing sign and a goat that doesn't work, or a gate that doesn't work. You probably have a goat too. What do I know? You also have a <laughs> moat of rattlesnakes uh, and coyotes, and you are heavily armed, so I am not shocked. Did you do anything to indicate you wanted trick-or-treaters? Well... Usually when you leave your porch light on, that is an indication you want trick-or-treaters. And there is a street light that we pay for that we had the city install down by the gate. So kind of. Is that street light on all the time? Yes. Okay, so there, there was nothing to indicate that. So if I were driving past your house what? at 55 miles an hour, I would just assume that anybody who stopped there would get shot. <laughs> There's some truth, or eaten by a coyote. If you have like a bag full of candy and you're running, like that's those are two indicators that it's time to kill to every coyote in the land. Do you know how weird that would have looked if you were down there at the gate a mile from your house, just sitting in a lawn chair with a bowl of candy as cars whipped by you down the highway? I mean, you not only would you have had nobody stop, like somebody would have called the police. <laughs> James, I might actually do that for a photo op. Now that you say it, that's glorious. I want to do that. Oh, man, you... ah, surely we have a lawn chair. We have folding chairs, but I want like an old fashioned, like waffle grid lawn chair <laughs> and sit there with a bowl of candy on the open highway. Oh, that'll be glorious. Yeah, I don't know why you need a lawn chair as you sit on the floor of your completely empty office. Like, don't put on airs. We know you're not good enough for a chair. Just sit on the ground. Oh. Yeah, because uh, you can't even stop or it would be dangerous in front of my house. There, we're, there's a blind curve. There are several <laughs> skid marks on the streets where 18-wheelers have had to lock it up because people, like, slow down or... If uh, there's anything that stops traffic, you can't see until it's too late, and it's a pretty sharp downhill. So, oh, it, it's going to be glorious. I got to think of something oh. to do tonight. I don't have a costume though. Well, your your face think... is scary enough. Like it it will frighten the children. <laughs> you're good. So, you have been on this like year long project to integrate yourself in the local community. You go in and you traumatize the waitresses every day with your half coke, half diet coke order. <laughs> You, uh, you, you're in the, th you're in the play there. You do all this stuff. You write for the newspaper, and uh, I, I'm impressed that after all of that, you were not invited to a single Halloween party. But if you had, you could have just gone to one of those people's houses with your own bowl of candy to make it a double stop and given out candy there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If only I was accepted as a human being out there. But alas, it's not to be. So I have to cut my own path. And using one of Breakwell's ideas, there's nothing good that can become of this, and that's what I'm going after. I can just see you setting up this photo, and Mrs. Steve going out there to take a picture of you when she will be run over by an 18-wheeler coming around that blind curve. <laughs> and it won't even well, be an accident. It will be those government officials who know you open the laptop coming uh, to finish oh. things off. <laughs> wow! 
And how are we doing on time? That's perfect. And we, got- we need to drop the mic. That was fabulous. I, that, that, that is all I do. I bring my best work here when I roll in 10 minutes late in costume. You are welcome, Steve, and you are welcome, world. <laughs> well, you are also welcome to join us next week when we return and find out, A, how much candy Breakwell got, uh, because, of course, his daughters can't eat it all, and, frankly, he wants to make sure it's not poison, and, B, if either Steve or Mrs. Steve died trying to come up with a great way to celebrate Halloween without any children, without any trick-or-treaters, and, frankly, without any joy or merriment. But until then... This is Steve Ali. This is Dr. Steve for James the Exploding Groove Breakwell saying thanks for watching, thanks for listening, and remember as always, two wrongs can make a right.